Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are located. And thank you once again for joining us for this Amatech SEI webinar on the 19th of April, 2023. Uh, the topic today is increasing reliability by performing maintenance and why we perform maintenance. But before we go any further, I just want to ask, as I always do when we first start these webinars, can you hear me? There's no point in me jabbering and uh, speaking to myself if people can't hear me. So if you go to the chat bar on the right hand side and let me know whether you can hear me or not, that would be fantastic. So I'll wait for people to reply before I go any further. Thank you very much. You can hear me. Good, good, good. So my name is Craig Williams. I am the Senior Technical Manager for Amatech Solid State Controls, and I work out of the Stafford, Texas office, which is just southwest of Houston. I have more than 20 years in the industrial UPS industry, working with various different manufacturers and um, I've been with Amatech for, I think this is the beginning of my seventh year now. Um, started off as a training manager, and now I'm the senior technical manager. Um, there will be a lag of around 30 seconds between you hearing my voice and me seeing any question or a reply when I ask a question. Uh, we use the um, a company called Webinar Jam for our webinar, and they have to convert this signal into iOS, uh, Windows, Android signals uh, so they can be viewed on all of the devices. And there is some processing time that takes place when that happens. So um, from the time that I say something from the, to the time that you hear it is probably around about 15 uh, to 20 seconds, to be honest. So if I'm talking on a topic and you have a question or a comment, I'm not going to see it for about 15, 20 seconds. So what I tend to do is if you do have questions as we go along, please type them in the Q&A only tab. So you can see in your chat tab, there is a chat and there is a Q&A only. If you type it in the Q&A only, then at the end of the webinar i'll go into the q a and i'll go through all the questions as they were asked and see if i can answer them for you webinar jam has a panic button so if i do see that uh, there is an issue with the transmitting of this webinar um, i can press the panic button and what webinar jam does is it creates a new room invites everybody into that new room and uh, we carry on as if nothing had happened another popular question is will the webinar be recorded and yes webinar jam does record uh, the webinar and pretty much immediately after the webinar it's finished you will be able to uh, view it through a link um, on your webinar registration the problem with that webinar version is that you cannot fast forward and rewind and, and go to pertinent points inside the presentation. You've got to watch the whole thing through as if it was a live webinar again, which can be uh, frustrating for people. So what our fantastic um, marketing department do is they convert that video into a mp4 and upload it to our youtube channel and anna has put the link to our youtube channel in the chat bar there and you can do whatever you want with that video you can share it with your colleagues friends um you can pause rewind fast forward um it's just like a normal uh, youtube video and when you go to that link that anna has posted you'll be able to see all of our previous webinars on there as well so um, there, there's a lot of good stuff uh, in our webinar library and as always the webinar should last around about one hour depending on how many questions we have okay so today we're going to hopefully help you understand why you should perform maintenance on your ups systems 
um, what maintenance should be performed. Obviously, that's very important. Um, understand why Amatech recommend the maintenance time intervals that we do, why they were created. And then we're going to discuss the use of specialized equipment that are used during maintenance. Okay. So why perform maintenance? Well, the, the key aim is reliability and getting reliability as close to 100% as we possibly can. Now, in most circumstances, that's not going to be possible. But if we do have planned a planned maintenance regime, um, we can get uh, close to 100% reliability, which in the end saves money for everybody. Because the uptime of any piece of equipment, especially a UPS, um, equals safety plus money. In other words, every time a UPS fails, it's on critical equipment that can cause a safety issue. Valves shutting in, um, processes shutting down in an uncontrolled manner. Um, there's a lot of safety implications when a UPS shuts down uncontrolled because of a failure. Um, and then that leads on to uh, financial losses. Um, if a UPS goes down and the process has to go down, then that can lead to losses of millions of dollars a day in lost production. Um, so it's critical that we try and keep our UPS systems up and running um, as much of the time as we possibly can. And for those... Uh, people out there who are reliability engineers or uh, know a little bit about uh, maintenance frequency. This is a very standard graph um, that is available on the internet. And you can see right up in this corner here, uh, that is when we don't perform any planned maintenance. Starting here, what's happening is if you look, the blue line is corrective maintenance. So we're only doing correct, corrective maintenance at this point here. The green line, this line here, is the total cost of maintenance on uh, that piece of equipment, okay? So you can see here that if you're only doing corrective maintenance and no planned maintenance, the uh, cost is extremely high. And on the flip side, if we go all the way to the end here, we can see we're doing a lot of planned maintenance here, more than necessary, um, and yes, corrective maintenance is still going down, but you can see because we're doing so much planned maintenance, the cost is starting to go back up again. So the sweet point, the optimum PM frequency is right in here when we're doing a good selection of uh, corrective and planned maintenance. Okay, really just where, uh, if we look, right down here that's the point here that we're trying to get to trying to get to a level where we do only a certain amount of pms and that leads to less corrective maintenance and here's two examples this first example is um, a bad example where it's all reactive maintenance basically we're only doing 36 percent plan maintenance and 64 percent breakdown maintenance and the goal is get to get to 80% plan maintenance and therefore only 20% breakdown. Because this slide here says that one maintenance hour is worth two breakdown hours. A lot of people out there actually say one plan maintenance hour is actually worth three breakdown hours. Okay, because if the production delay is planned, then the machine operators can be reassigned ahead of time and any ripple effects of the operating flow downstream from the machine can be managed better. So if everybody knows that the UPS is having maintenance performed on it, then if something does go wrong, everybody is in place to make sure you, we can get the, the loads back up and running again as necessary. Most people know who work in the plants that most Unplanned maintenance tends to happen on Friday and Saturday evenings for some bizarre reason where there is not so many people at the plant. You've got to call people in and it takes a long time to get there. Everybody's running around like a headless chicken trying to figure out what's going on. That is not the situation um, you want to be in, if at all possible. Okay. 
And this just breaks down that pie chart that we had um, previously. So what they're saying is if we have 100 hours and uh, we're only doing 36% planned and 64% uh, reactive, um, the percentage of planned work is 36%. What's important here is to see how many hours total are being worked because if we go all the way down to the bottom here, okay, yes, if we increase the planned maintenance from 36 to 53, um, we are increasing the maintenance cost for planned maintenance, but you can see how much the unplanned reactive maintenance goes down. It goes down to 13%, and therefore the overall hours being spent on maintenance is now 66 hours rather than 100 when you perform the right balance of planned maintenance. So there are huge cost savings involved if you do your maintenance correctly. And as I mentioned before, remember the UPS is the last line of defense. Everything connected to a UPS is critical. Uh, that's why it's connected to a UPS. So if the UPS fails and there's no bypass, if it just completely crashes, then production must shut down in most cases. All of your fail safes will come into place and uh, everything will shut down in your production process. And that can cost millions of dollars. So we want to prevent that as much as we possibly can. So what are the failure modes? You know, what maintenance should we perform with regards to what type of failure modes that we see in big industrial electronic equipment? Well, the first one is high resistance connections. Um, it could be insufficient pressure in a compression lug. Um, in other words, it hasn't been crimped correctly. It could be that the contact service surface has dirt or corrosion. Uh, you can see here that's starting to corrode a little bit. And if that got onto this surface area here, that would cause a high resistance connection. And this picture on the right hand side is a perfect example of what either a loose connection or a high resistance connection can do. There is going to be a voltage drop associated with that. And when there's current flowing through voltage, there is power. And that power is going to be dissipated in heat. And you can see how much heat was created here. And eventually that could have gone on fire if you know maybe this did go on fire, um, which is definitely a situation we want to stay away from because if it's in a room that has fire suppression systems, that's going to go off. It's going to do whatever it needs to do, whether it's foam or um, a halon system. You don't want smoke in your electronic equipment. So um, high resistance connections um, and deficient contact surfaces uh, are something that you have to be very, very aware of. And the best way to check for these things, rather than go in and check every connection with a, a torque wrench, um, is to use thermal imaging, um, infrared thermal imaging. Um, and I put a picture here of the FLIR C1 camera. Um, that's what most of our technicians in the field use. We are moving on to the FLIR Edge now. Uh, we are phasing these out and moving to the FLIR Edge, but they're very, very good. And here's a great example of during a planned maintenance visit, one of our field service engineers found a high resistance connection. And um, it's very difficult to tell for most people from here, but this these are capacitors, AC capacitors within our uh, UPS system. And there is a terminal here, and there is a terminal here, there's a terminal here, and a terminal here, okay? You can see on most of the capacitors, the uh, terminals are not showing up as a hotspot but on this terminal here it is showing up uh 20 degrees fahrenheit above every other connection so that was brought to the fse's attention when he took this picture so therefore he powered the system down performed his maintenance and when he went in he found that one of the wires going to this capacitor um wasn't connected correctly it actually wasn't on the spade terminal it was accidentally pushed on between the spade terminal and the plastic collar that surrounds the uh, the two terminal pins. And that was just a, 
an accident waiting to happen. If that had been left for a long time, that would have heated up over and over and over again, and it could have led uh, to a fire. So very simple um, example of how infrared um, thermal imaging can help you find uh, hotspots with high resistance connections. And on the complete flip side of that, Here's another great example of thermal imaging showing us issues. And this time it's actually the opposite. This was on a huge, uh, I think it was over 100 kVA UPS system. And we have three chokes here. This one here, this one here. They're all identical chokes, one for each phase of uh, the output of the inverter. And because this was such a large system, it had interconnections between two different cabinets. And when the cabinet was assembled on site, one of the connections wasn't made correctly. And this choke here was bypassed. Um, and it would never have been caught um, because the choke is only acting as a filter and you would have to have full load on the system basically to be able to see that the choke wasn't filtering as it should and the to total high harmonic distortion of the output of the UPS would have gone up significantly. But when this was being tested and there was light load on the system, the, the output would have looked pretty normal. Um, so this is a great example of thermal imaging where we found that this choke wasn't actually connected in circuit. So we had to go in and do a remedial action um, for that. So connection issues are true. Uh, they are out there all the time and uh, you need to pay attention to them. Another thing that people get a little bit blasé about or they don't take as seriously, seriously as they should is dust. Um, the IEEE study uh, that was done a few years ago showed that 18% of all switchgear failures listed dust as the main contributing cause. Okay, so that's, so 20%, so that is basically to have, so one out of every five failures in switchgear um, could be listed down to dust. And this, these pictures on this page here show you, um, it's, I think it's actually a computer system, um, but you can see on the right-hand side, this one here, how dusty it is. And when it's cleaned off, this is what it should look like. And we don't know what's inside dust. Dust could have some kind of uh, powder or substance in it that is conductive or um, that dust could become moist with humidity and that could become conductive. But basically what dust allows is for short circuits or arcing between two components that's not supposed to happen. And that will cause failure of a control board or a, a, a switch. Um, and would be a very bad day for everybody. So it's extremely critical, especially in um, rooms where you put equipment that aren't in such a clean environment that you do regular cleaning of that system, okay? And every annual PM that Amatec SCI uh, performs includes a thorough cleaning of the system to remove dust and debris. It's extremely crit critical because you've also got to remember that in most of our UPSs, there are large updraft, up, sorry, updraft fans pulling air through the bottom of the UPS system up through the UPS through the transformer through the heat sinks on the top of the system to get that air out of the UPS um, to get that heat out of the UPS and in doing so if it is an industrial environment those fans are going to be drawing some dust into uh, the UPS itself it's inevitable unfortunately Another issue um, that can come up through normal operation of any electrical system um, is relay failures. Every time the contacts of an electromechanical relay or contact are opened or closed, there is going to be a certain amount of contact wear. You know, if you took a microscope out to this, what looks like a very clean surface, um, you will actually see on that surface, there will be pits, valleys, troughs, raised areas, um, and it won't be completely flat. So when 
these two areas that look like that under a microscope um, connect, there's only going to be like this point here is going to connect. Maybe this point here is going to connect. The whole surface area of that contact is not going to make contact. And therefore, on some parts of the other uh, circumference, I would say, of the contact surface, there, are going to, there is going to be arcing. And there's always going to be arcing whenever you go really close to closing or as soon as you open the contact. So you can see this is what the contacts look when they are new. And after a few thousand operations, you can see that the arcing has caused degradation and oxidization on the contact surface of the relay. This will cause high resistance connections, which could cause faulty operation of the circuit that the relay is in. So it is very important, especially in relays that are critical to the operation of a piece of equipment, that they are replaced on a regular basis so this never, ever happens because that is just asking for trouble if you left relays in long enough to have the contact surface area look like that. So that is why we always recommend uh, replacing relays on uh, critical relays on an annual basis. And the other thing that happens with relays is they can weld closed. You can see this one here. This is what it should look like. Nice, shiny and clean. But these contacts here have welded. Um, the arc um, melted some of the copper um, and the plasma in the arc was so hot that it allowed other parts of the metal to uh, evaporate and basically cause this, uh, these contacts to weld together. So if you replace relays on a regular basis, this should not happen. Okay. Another thing that we see on a regular basis is capacitor failures if the planned maintenance for the UPS is not followed. And capacitors are just like short-term short -term batteries. Um, and batteries are affected by age and temperature. So a capacitor has electrolyte in it, and that electrolyte is in a liquid form, usually inside a capacitor, it's soaked into um, some form of paper, but that electrolyte eventually will dry out with age and temperature. And when it starts to dry out, um, it starts to become resistive and will cause the capacitor to heat up. And then that heat will cause the capacitor to expand. And basically, you can see in this picture here, this is what the bus bar should look like. And this capacitor here, there's the, the lid or the top of the capacitor can. You can see that it's completely burst out and bent that bus bar. So it's a very significant event when an electrolytic DC capacitor uh, lets go and fails. And there would have been a lot of smoke involved um, with this failure as well. Uh, you can see there's a lot of... Uh, electrolyte debris um, around the failed capacitor as well. So um, we, we really want to be able to prevent this, okay? And the capacitor manufacturers, every capacitor manufacturer in the world lists the anticipated life of their capacitor in hours, okay? And that life is based on the capacitor staying within certain parameters, and that's voltage, temperature, and ripple current. So the, the capacitor manufacturer will say you must stay within, um, let's say, less than 105 degrees Fahrenheit, and you will get a certain amount of hours at that temperature range with the voltage within tolerance and the ripple within tolerance. If you operate the capacitor at temperatures above the maximum rate of temperature, that life will degree, the life of that capacitor will decrease by half for every 10 degrees Celsius above its operating temperature. That's significant. Um, now, obviously that increase in temperature by 10 degrees has to be all the time. So basically, if you run a capacitor at 10 degrees above what it's supposed to be Celsius for, for a year, what they're saying is you have now reduced 
the the life of that capacitor uh, by half. So if it's a 10 year capacitor and you run it at 10 degrees uh, above the manufacturer's tolerance for five years, then five years will be the end of life for that capacitor. Okay. Also, the life of the capacitor can be increased um, by the ratio between the rated voltage and the applied voltage. So if you're not applying as much voltage, your temperature is cooler, um, you will get additional life out of your capacitor. Um, and with all these parameters entered in for the spec of our UPS system, the design engineers and the manufacturer of the capacitors all came together and said that our capacitor will last 10 years. So that's why we replace um, capacitors on a 10 year basis. It's because of all the parameters that the uh, capacitor manufacturers gives us, we extrapolate all of that data and it says 10 years is the expected lifespan of our DC electrolytic capacitors. We don't just make it up. If the DC capacitors start to fail, the ripple voltage current seen by the battery will increase, which can lead to internal heating in VRLA batteries, which could then lead to thermal runaway. So um, it can even cause micro cycling of wet cell batteries as well. So um, part of your maintenance regime should be checking the ripple uh, going to your batteries and if you see that increasing year over year then it could be an indication that the capacitors inside your UPS or charger could be failing. And once again I mentioned that heat is the biggest killer of capacitors and um, you're, it's difficult to tell in this picture but this is a capacitor bank down here. This hotspot here is actually a uh, discharge resistor. It's supposed to be that color. But basically what our field service guys are looking for is this. They can see all these capacitors and there is nothing that is looking hotter than it should be. That is ideal. That is what we are looking for. Okay. Also, heat stress is extremely important for electronic components. High temperature causes over 50% of electronic equipment failures, according to a study by the US Air Force Avionics Integrity Program. 50%, so one in two failures um, during that US Air Force study showed that high temperatures um, had some effect on the failure. So that is why uh, the majority of our UPSs have fans in them, is we want to get that heat out of our UPS so we don't have any uh, temperature related failures. And also we've got to pay attention to our fan life. And once again, that is determined by the manufacturer of our fans and they tell us how many hours to expect um, for certain temperatures. And we extrapolated that data and it says our fan life has been calculated at around about five years um, within the temperature tolerance of our UPS, which is up to an operating temperature of 105 degrees Fahrenheit. So you should get five years life out of your fan as long as your UPS internal temperature um, is 105 degrees Fahrenheit or less. And age and temperature uh, are also major factors in PCB failures. You can see down here, we have an electrolytic capacitor. So once again, that capacitor is gonna have a finite life. And then these tantalum capacitors, you can't see very well, but there's a positive symbol right there. Here's another tantalum capacitor there. And I think that's another tantalum capacitor there. Tantalum capacitors are also electrolytic style capacitors. They do um, fail over time with respect to temperature as well. So that's why control boards have to be replaced every 10 years because they have capacitors on them and any of those capacitors failing um, can cause misoperation of the PCB um, and cause 
the PCB to fail and therefore the operation of the UPS um, will probably fail also the inverter or the charger will shut down which is definitely not what we want so if we can stay ahead of the game and perform the maintenance at a regular at the regular times we can prevent those capacitors from failing and if we zoom into some failed capacitors um, you can see here these ones are leaking and it's not easy to tell from here but if you look at the shading on each of these quadrants you can see that it is actually starting to swell. There, there is a peak forming on those capacitors. So these capacitors are failing and the operation of that control board has probably been affected uh, by those capacitors failing. Now, another thing that people don't realize is that remote manual bypass switches need to be exercise the switches if you never ever operate the switch on an rmbs and then after five years you want to go and move it from normal position to bypass after five years of non-operation then you could be asking for problems because the uh, the contacts within that um, switch because they have not been moved uh, could have oxidized slightly could have seized um, that there are many things that can go wrong with a switch that never gets operated and this slide is actually a really good example of, of what the manufacturer recommends this is um, an email that we got from electro switch one of the uh, engineers from electro switches and the electro switch is one of the companies that manufacture our RMBSs. And they said, many customers will, as a rule of thumb, operate or exercise the switch at least once a year. And he goes on to say, as you know, they have a unique dual wiping self-cleaning blade and terminal interface. And that helps maintain a low contact resistance over the life of the switch. So every time you move the switch from one position to another, there is a self-cleaning blade and terminal interface um, and the mechanism wipes the surface uh, to maintain a low contact resistance. Um, so operating the switch really does help keep those contacts in uh, a clean mode of operation and prevents high resistance connections there. So it is important that you operate your remote manual bypass switch on at least a, an annual basis. And that's part of the maintenance that Amatech Field Service um, supply. And we have three types of recommended um, PMs um, within our systems. This is Amatech SCI as a whole, okay? And they are, I'll list them um, on each separate page. The first one is what we do on an annual PM or what we call a PM1. So first of all, we check and record all the voltages and currents for trending. And we check against all the tolerances for our UPS. So for example, the tolerance, let's say the tolerance for our input uh, is 480 volts uh, plus or minus 10%, just for ease. So that would be 48 volts below would be uh, 432 volts and 48 volts above would be 522 volts. So if the parameters of the AC input to that, to that system were out with that tolerance, then we would note it in the report and make sure that the plant knew that the uh, AC input for that UPS is out of tolerance and they would need to go and retap the transformer um, or do something to make sure the input is closer to 480. And that applies to every other voltage, whether it's bypass, the DC voltage. Um, we check all of those parameters against what they should be, okay? We also check the input to our charges for balanced current into the bridge. In any three-phase um, charger bridge, the input current to the SCRs on each phase should be very, very balanced. They should be pretty much identical. So if there is unbalanced current into the charge bridge, that probably means that there is an SCR that is not being fired correctly. 
We also calibrate all voltages and current readings on the UPS um, with respect to a true RMS uh, volt or current meter. Uh, we use Fluke 87s and Fluke I 410s. Um, so we are making sure that whether it's analog meters or digital meters on the UPS itself, we're making sure that they are showing you exactly what the actual voltages are. We also simulate a full loss of power to the UPS and make sure that the UPS um, does not transfer and maintains your load circuit. So basically, we will switch off the AC input and we will switch off the bypass input if the plant gives us permission to do this. And we will run on batteries and inverter only and make sure that the system does it correctly. Now, we'll be able to do this with a system in remote bypass position uh, without effect jeopardizing the loads. Um, and we just want to make sure that uh, the system, if all power went off, maintains the, the load circuits through the battery and the inverter. We also test the auxiliary contacts and shunt trip circuits um, to the DC input breaker by simulating a low DC voltage disconnect. Near enough, all UPS manufacturers have this um, threshold that we have to protect the batteries from being over discharged. For a 60 cell system, it's 105 volts DC. So there is a circuit within our UPS. Once it gets down to 105 volts, if we lose AC power and the batteries are discharging, once it gets down to 105 volts, then the circuit says, OK, we need to protect the batteries and it will trip the DC input breaker and uh, shut the system down, basically. So we have to verify that that circuit works and we do that during the PM. We also test all the applicable alarm set points to ensure that all the alarms work at the voltages with the time delays and the correct set points. Um, that they should do. And we refer to the factory test data to make sure that they are all um, as they should be. We also verify the free running frequency of the inverter um, because the inverter has an internal uh, quartz oscillator on the control board in all of our UPSs um, that basically if we lose our bypass supply and we have no reference uh, frequency or voltage to synchronize to, then the inverter will default to its 60 hertz, uh, in North America anyway, its 60 hertz crystal, and it will run at exactly 60 hertz. And we have to test that to make sure that that circuit is functioning. Um, and all we do is remove the bypass supply from the UPS and then test what the frequency of the inverter is. We also test the over temperature thermocouples. So um, there are, on the heat sinks of all of our uh, semiconductor devices, there are thermal uh, switches. And if the temperature gets above 90 degrees Celsius, then um, the inverter will shut down for the inverter heat sink. And for the charger, the, the charger will shut off um, also if it gets above 90 degrees Celsius. Uh, so we test those circuits to make sure that that actually does happen. We also verify all AC caps are functioning by taking voltage readings across the capacitor bank. This is more specified to our uh, ferro resonance systems. Um, the AC capacitors in the tank circuit, we want to make sure that they are working. We Not only do we take voltage readings, we take uh, current readings as well. We test the ripple current into the battery to ensure that it's less than 5%. Um, and we also compare it to the last reading we were at to make sure that the ripple current um, isn't changing. Um, if it changes, then that's indicative of a battery failure or maybe a capacitor failure. And then any other functional tests deemed by the field service engineer to verify proper operation because our UPSs are very customized. So there may be other things that we need to check based specifically on the design of that system. Um, and that could be for battery charges. We check the flow equalized functions, load share and any alarm functions for inverters and static switches. We want to check that the transfers take place, verify um, that there is no interruption via the control push buttons or a simulated inverter failure by crashing, crashing the DC 
and uh, we can capture those transfers on an oscilloscope. And then for the annual PM, we will replace some parts, and that could be uh, pilot lights and critical relays. Uh, so on our, our older systems, um, especially incandescent lights, we will, will replace on an annual basis and the safety critical relays that we mentioned in the slides before. And then every five years, we will do everything that we did in the annual PM, and then we will do uh, the scheduled parts replacement and we'll replace pilot lights, fuses, fans, and relays. Okay. And then for a 10 year PM, we will do everything that's in a PM1, and then we will replace all the regular parts, the capacitors, uh, sorry, the, the pilot lights, fans, and relays, but we will also replace capacitors because of the slide that we mentioned earlier, at the 10 year point, the manufacturer recommends we replace those capacitors. And then also we replace the printed circuit boards inside the system because those printed circuit boards have capacitors on them as well. So remember what we're trying to do is ensure that the reliability of the UPS can be trusted and we're not gonna have any failures as much as we possibly can. So that's why it's critical to follow uh, the maintenance procedure. And additional optional services that you can get when you're doing your PMs is we can do um, a capacity test on your battery. Um, you can do a full system AC test. We can put a load bank on the output of your UPS and run it to full 100% load and make sure that it is uh, still able to do that. And we also offer um, for very old constant voltage transformer systems. Um, we, or we do replace transformers that um, are showing signs of failure or that have actually failed. So here are the tools that all of our field service engineers take out um, to site to perform the PM services on an Amatec UPS. So we take out a Fluke 87, Every single one of our field service guys has a Fluke 190 oscilloscope, uh, a Fluke I-410 uh, amp clamp, some form of FLIR um, infrared thermal imaging, uh, whether it's a FLIR C1 or the new FLIR Edge, um, a laptop, and now every single one of our field service engineers also has an iPad uh, because we're doing all of our reports using an offline app um, on an iPad um, and we can download all of the pictures from the cameras and the oscilloscopes into that iPad um, and get a very, very in-depth report at the end of it. And a lot of people say, well, why do you take an oscilloscope out to every visit? And it's actually critically important for a, a lot of the things that we do. For example, this is a healthy output of a three-phase uh, six SCR charger. The frequency of the output should be 360 hertz because there are six pulses per cycle for three phases. So six times 60 is equal to 360 hertz. And you can see that these are symmetrical. They're happening at the same time. Everything looks good on this screen. Okay. But if that charger isn't working correctly, you might see an output like this. And there are actually two pulses missing here. Okay, uh, two pulses missing here. And you'd be surprised to find out that a system that is running like this probably won't give you any alarms to tell you that some of the SCRs are not, failure, uh, are not firing correctly. Because the DC, because of the capacitor circuit and the inductor circuit, it's filtering this out to a DC level. And if there isn't, if there is less than 50% load on that system, it will probably be able to maintain enough voltage and current to uh, supply the inverter or whatever loads that you have. And you might not see that the charger has an issue. So in this circumstance here, if we, Every single one of our technicians will check this uh, 
oscilloscope reading. And if we see this, we know that there is a, a failure on the SCR somewhere or on the gate drive circuit and that we need to go in uh, and fix it. So it's very um, important. That's a great example of how planned maintenance can help you find issues that somewhere down the line could lead into um, a, an unplanned maintenance occurrence that, that could lose you money or cause uh, some safety issues. Another waveform that we take is synchronization. So this is exactly what it should look like. The phase displacement between the two waveforms is about four electrical degrees. So it's difficult to tell here, but the red waveform is probably the inverter. The blue waveform is the bypass, and they should be perfectly synchronized together. Okay, and that allows a seamless transfer from inverter to bypass or from bypass to inverter if there is an issue. Now, if we walked up to a UPS and we saw this waveform, you can quite clearly see that red is the inverter, blue is the bypass. There is a phase displacement between those two um, circuits. And I think it says uh, let me see, 62 electrical degrees. So this is not synchronized. And if you try to transfer from inverter to bypass at this point here, you'd cause a huge amount of circulating current and you're gonna trip breakers, you could damage the inverter. It would be a very bad day. Uh, so we have to make sure that the system is synchronized. And then what we also do, which is a very interesting picture, is we look at the transfer to bypass and then the transfer back to inverter. If you look at this waveform here, the red is the output voltage of the UPS. And the blue is the current flowing in the bypass. So up to this point here, there was no current flowing in the bypass circuit because we were on inverter, okay? So what happened at this point here, somebody pressed the bypass to load push button and transferred the system to bypass. And you can see that there is no change in the output voltage whatsoever when that happened. So we know that that was a very good transfer. So we do that at every single annual PM. We make sure that the system transfers without a break. And I just, this next slide shows you a worst case scenario. This is the exact same a scenario we've transferred from um, inverter to bypass so i zoomed in so you could see it so this point here this red waveform here that's inverter and this red waveform here is bypass okay and what we did in this system is we actually crashed the inverter and when i say crashed the inverter what we did was we switched off uh, the AC input to the inverter that it was running on batteries and then we opened the the battery input breaker so the the inverter had no DC voltage going to it and the inverter just crashes it's the worst thing that you can pretty much do to an inverter so what you can see is at this point here the voltage crashes okay but then the static switch picks up and we are back to bypass voltage at this point here. So if we measure between here and here, it's about eh, it's about one and a half um, uh, units of measurement on this oscilloscope. And because that's two milliseconds, that could be in theory about three milliseconds. That actually looks, looks like it's two milliseconds to be honest. And what we're doing is we're checking the spec of our UPS. Worst case scenario, you will see a four millisecond um, uh, dead space between transferring from inverter to bypass. And pretty much a four millisecond uh, dead space will not cause any of your load circuits to drop. Um, this notch here would not have caused any issues on your load circuits in 99% of um, circumstances. So that's a good example of seeing exactly what's going on in the static switch at the transfer point. Uh, very, very good information to have. And then our fluke oscilloscopes also have software that can uh, look at the 
total harmonic distortion of the output of the system. This one here was 1.17%, uh, so well within the tolerances of what it should be. So there are so many things that we can check with the oscilloscope. And just to let you know, all of our field service guys um, conform to the NFPA 70 standards, so they wear category two PPE when they are working on the UPS system. So they will have arc flash FRs um, rated to the correct cal, which has to be eight cal per centimeter squared or more, arc flash shields, um, balaclava, safety glasses, uh, earplugs. They will have all of these this PPE available to do the maintenance when they're taking live readings. Okay. And the last thing, I'm not a sales guy. I'm really not trying to sell our maintenance. I just want to tell you what maintenance should be performed. But the benefits of you having Amatec come out and perform regular maintenance, although, yes, we are a little bit um, more expensive than most people out there. But what that maintenance regime gives you is a full bumper to bumper parts warranty on your piece of equipment. So if, we, if your machine is eight years old, we come out and do an annual PM. So we just come in there, shut it down, clean it out, uh, replace the relays. And then three months later, the main control board fails. Then you, you will get a brand new control board free of charge. Um, labor is also covered, but travel and living is charged um, at how much it costs. Um, and the emergency service fee to for us to come out at a very short period of uh, short notice of time will be waived as well. So if you do regular PMs um, and Amatec come out and perform that service, then pretty much your UPS is covered if anything goes wrong, except for transformers. And you would have to contact your sales guy um, about that. So there are big benefits from following your maintenance regime, obviously in reliability. And then if anything happens, um, Amatec will cover bumper to bumper all your parts um, and labor, excluding um, travel and living costs. Okay, so it's a very good warranty you get for the whole life of your UPS. So now that's about as salesy as I get. Let me go to the questions. Let's see what we have. And if you have any other questions on uh, what we discussed today or anything else it, to that matter. You can type it in the Q&A portion and uh, we will um, discuss it. So the first question is, can I provide the IEEE, IEEE study related to the failures for dust? Um, unfortunately, you have to be an IEEE member to get gain access to that. So I cannot provide that. Uh, you have to be an IEEE member, then you would just go into uh, the the archive or the database and, and try and find that study. Uh, what is the recommendation for testing and or replacing the CVT? Um, there are, uh, if anybody doesn't know, CVT is a constant voltage transformer. That's part of our uh, fair resonance systems. The recommendation for replacing the CVT is based on a few things. First of all, heat. Um, as the CVT degrades over time, um, it will eventually start to heat up as the laminations start to vibrate more and cause uh, more of the varnish between the laminations to wear down. And um, so we have specific temperatures at the factory. Uh, we know when it was running at full load what the temperature of the CVT should be. And if it starts going out with that temperature excessively, then we would recommend that the CVT is replaced before it fails. Um, another thing is noise. Um, that's not quite as easy to follow um, because you would have to do a noise sample of your UPS um, every year and try and figure out if there's any external noise when you do that sound measurement. Um, so that's a very difficult one to follow. But if it is getting obviously noisier and noisier 
uh, year over year, then our field service guys will definitely recommend that that transformer is replaced based on noise and temperature. And then there's one other thing that you can look for when the laminations are in the core of the transformer are vibrating. Um, they can cause some of the varnish to grind down into a dust. So if you see a white dust on top of the core of your transformer, that is also indicative that your transformer could be fa failing. So a very good question. Um, what encourages oxidization of contacts other than being dormant for long periods? Good question, Edmund. Um, in many of the chemical and uh, refineries, uh, pet, uh, sorry, chemical plants and refineries, there could be corrosive substances in the atmosphere. H2S is probably one of the, the main ones. And if H2S gets on any metallic contact, um, it can cause oxidization. So um, if they're not being wiped frequently, um, chemicals in the atmosphere can cause uh, further oxidi oxidization of those contacts. Um, what is the life of the transformers or when should they be replaced? There is no specific lifespan of a transformer. We for our fair resonance systems, we pretty much say that there should be 20, you should get at least 20 years out of your fair resonant transformer. For your regular isolation transformers, uh, dry type transformers, really there is no limitation on those. Um, so there is no set schedule for when transformers should be replaced. It is on a a case by case basis on whether there is excessive noise or temperature. And then um, one of our customers has typed in as a private question. Um, can I give you more information about oil leakages on AC capacitors, especially about the ceiling between the capacitor body and capacity cover? Um, I don't have any specific information on that at present. Um, we are looking for further details on the specific manufacturer of capacitor that we use. Um, but basically the, the can, which is the, the capacitor container and the, the lid of the capacitor are crimped together. And obviously the, the manufacturer has quality standards that they should maintain to make sure that, that crimp is a good crimp and uh, there is no leakage of oil in the AC capacitors um, in normal operation. So um, we'll have to find out more from the manufacturer about um, any type of leakages that they have experienced um, during the manufacturing process or what they've seen in the field. Um, and he's also asked, can I give more information about acceptable criteria for measurements on the DC and AC capacitors? Basically, um, on all AC and DC capacitors, they will tell you what the maximum voltage rating is. And the usually the, the ripple, if I remember correctly, I don't have a capacitor on me just now, um, but if it doesn't have the ripple, you can go to the data sheet for that capacitor and uh, get the ripple, or you can contact us for the acceptable ripple. So really it's just um, capacitors are voltage uh, tolerant. In other words, you, you should not exceed the voltage of the capacitors. That's really the criteria that we're looking for uh, when we're looking at maintaining capacitors. So that seems to be all the questions in the Q&A. Let me go over. Um, doesn't seem to be any more questions in the, the chat bar either. So at this point here, wow, I finished exactly on the hour. Um, so Anna has posted in uh, the chat bar, um, the, the once again, the recording link that will be um, up tomorrow. Uh, the video will be on YouTube tomorrow. And if you have any additional questions or concerns, there is our 
web link to our contact us page. There's also the email that you can use to contact uh, SCI and your request will be directed to the appropriate contact. Or you can call us toll free and speak to a human at 1-800-635-7300. And Anna's mentioned one last thing. If you could take two minutes to complete our survey about this month's webinar, um, we do take every, uh, we do read every answer to our survey. We're always looking for topics to look, to go over on our future webinars. So if you do have time, please fill out that quick survey and let us know what you want the next webinar to be about. So that's it from me for today. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I do appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I know everybody is very busy and for you to spend an hour with us, it's very appreciated. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and I look forward to speaking to you next month. Thanks again and we'll speak again soon. Take care.